Good morning. Uh, let me begin by welcoming our witnesses. Uh, Christine Warmuth was recently confirmed as the 25th Secretary of the Army. She is no stranger to breaking barriers, and I look forward to working with her to tackle the tough issues in store over the coming years. General James McCarville is the 40th Chief of Staff of the Army. He's a warfighter first, having received too many awards and decorations to list in this short opening statement. His expertise as a distinguished helicopter pilot makes him uniquely qualified to help oversee the Army's current aviation modernization efforts. General, I want to thank you for your service, and we look forward to your testimony. As we continue our efforts to confront growing threats from abroad, the Army has recognized the need to become a more di distributed and agile force. In plain English, this means being able to fight on the move across the ground, air, sea, space, and cyber domains. There's always more room to collaborate with other services working in these domains, and I commend the Army for embarking on a historic change in how it will fight the wars of the future. To do this, the Army is on an aggressive pursuit of modernization, including ground combat vehicles, uh, soldier lethality, aviation, and long-range attack capabilities. The Army has tried this before. The last two decades saw tens of billions spent on R&D programs, but we have little to show for it. Today, we're beginning to see these modernization programs not only enter advanced development stages, but also initial production. Secretary Warmouth and, and General McCarville, this is promising news, and I ask you to keep the Army on this good track. The Army's budget took an overall top-line reduction, but still increased investment in its top priorities. As a subcommittee, we need to know whether the dollars in this budget are enough to continue development and increase production on all of these new capabilities without jeopardizing today's readiness. We must also look down the road a few years and ask if the Army is prepared to afford all these new systems that are getting ready to procure. High-tech weapons are expensive, and we must not be able to buy them fast enough if budgets remain stable. Uh, once again, I want to thank Mr. Warmouth and General McCarville for appearing here today. I look forward to your testimony and perspective on fiscal year 2022 budget. Senator Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Warmoth, uh, welcome to your first uh, hearing before our subcommittee in your new role. Congratulations. General McConnell, thank you also for being here. You're no stranger to this place. I look forward to hearing about the Army's budget proposal for 2022. This discussion is particularly important, I believe, because the Army's budget proposal reflects a 2% reduction for fiscal year 2021. The reduction is proposed despite the need to maintain readiness and make progress on key modernization priorities like the long-range hypersonic missile and the improved lethality capabilities. You're both well aware that our adversaries, including China and Russia, pose new and increasing threats that erode our traditional technological and battlefield advantages. They're making unprecedented investments in their capability and capacity. And China specifically has stated uh, stated object uh, of surpassing us by the middle of the century. They've made a lot of progress. We can't let them do that, though. Given that the overall funding request for the Department of Defense does not keep pace with inflation and the Army budget propose, proposal reflects a decrease from last year, I'm concerned that we're sending the wrong message to both our allies and our adversaries. I look forward to hearing today regarding the 2022 budget request uh, and look forward to question and answer time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Shelby. Uh, we'll start out with uh, your testimony, uh, Secretary Warmoth. Chairman Tester, Vice Chairman Shelby, distinguished members of the committee, thank you so much uh, for your continued support for our Army and our people, and thank you for the warm welcome today. I'm very glad to be here. It's a real privilege to be with you today, and I'd like to very um, honestly and earnestly take a moment to thank General McConville for his lifetime of service to our Army and to our nation. In my about a month of time in the job, uh, he's been a great partner, and we're off to a running start. I'm honored to be serving as the Secretary of the Army and to be working with Secretary Austin and Deputy Secretary Hicks once again. I thank them for their continued leadership. As I've stepped into the role, I am surprised and imp I am impressed, but not surprised, to see the state of our Army and its professionalism, the hard work of our soldiers and families, and the continued sacrifice that our soldiers and leaders make every day uh, as part of our, uh, the world's greatest land fighting force. 
I'd like to highlight a few key observations on the state of our Army as I see them today. First, the Army must continue to heavily invest in the development of its people. People are the strength of our Army. We're steadily working to enhance our force structure, build inclusive leadership, and invest in quality of life initiatives. Like my predecessors, I can assure you that the character, culture, and climate within our formations at every installation will reflect a continued focus on placing people first. The harmful behaviors of sexual assault and harassment, racism and extremism cannot and will not be tolerated. We will purposefully work to stem the tide of suicides that we've experienced in our Army in the last few years. Our responsibility is to ensure every soldier and civilian has the right leadership, policies, and resources to be safe and successful among their teams so that they can continue to be successful in our nation's defense. Second, the Army is now a leader in new technology. From Army Futures Command to cross-functional teams to the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office to fielding next-generation soldier equipment for individual unit members, the Army is prototyping and experimenting with new capabilities and concepts. The Army is at the forefront of developing and fielding new technology in counter UAS, directed energy, hypersonic weapons, next generation assured positioning navigation and timing devices, pushing software coding to the edge, and many other areas. Third, the Army is opening doors in the Indo-Pacific, Europe, and beyond. The Army can be relied upon to engage with our allies, foster partnerships, maintain deterrence, and set conditions for success prior to or while engaging in conflict. Deterrence requires boots on the ground, and our Department of Defense must be present to succeed in crisis. The Army is recognized as an enduring, reliable partner that can directly contribute by bringing resources, training, and expertise to countries in regions around the world. Our partnership can lay the groundwork for access and cooperation in contingencies and crisis. Fourth, the next fight will be an all-domain conflict. Future conflict will be in, across, all domains with ground forces to secure terrain, penetrate defenses, and achieve objectives. The Army's transformation is directly aimed at supporting joint warfighting that will depend on joint all-domain command and control, expeditionary joint logistics, and joint maneuver across domains. As the Army continues to modernize, we will maintain our overmatch against near-peer adversaries, helping make future conflict less likely by ensuring that the cost to our adversaries outweigh any benefit. And finally, the Army's readiness gains and modernization procurement requirements must be prioritized to continue. The Army recognizes the need to modernize concepts and capabilities to sharpen our global competitive edge. Working in close co coordination with you all in Congress, we established a deliberate, achievable path to deliver a ready, modernized Army. Significant progress has been made, but success can only be assured through continued transformation. The Army has already made and will continue to make tough decisions to ensure the best use of resources to adapt to and stay ahead of the capabilities of our adversaries, whether they are near peer nations or newly emergent threats. The Army will also compete successfully below the threshold of conflict. The President's budget will help us to care for our people, maintain and enhance our readiness, and innovate and modernize. With your continued support, we will pivot to next generation capabilities to ensure we can win now and in the future. Our Army is in great shape, but we have important work ahead. I want to use this window of opportunity in the next few years to make certain that the Army will continue to provide modernized and ready forces capable of responding globally. I join General McConville in striving to ensure we provide the Army with the resources it needs to succeed. I know the Chief is eager to share his thoughts as well, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Wormuth. Uh, General McConville. Well, th well, thank you, and I'd like to thank the Secretary for her leadership uh, during this critical time in the Army. Chairman Tester, Vice Chair Shelby, Distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and your continued support for, for our Army and our people, our soldiers, our families, our civilians, and our soldiers for life, our retirees and veterans. The, the Army currently has 485,000 active duty soldiers and a little more than a million in the total force. That is roughly the same size Army that we had on 9-11. 
Army soldiers are presently supporting combatant commanders around the world in more than 140 countries. They form the most lethal and decisive land force in the world, and they stand ready to fight and win the na nation's wars, wars as part of the joint force. I could not be more proud of each and every one of them. Since last October, the Army's priorities have been people, readiness, and modernization, making us well aligned with emerging national security guidance. Putting people first means recruiting and retaining the best talent our nation has to offer, maximizing their potential, and taking care of them. We are building a culture of cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit, where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. And that is how we prevent the harmful behaviors that hurt our soldiers and break trust with the American people. These being sexual assault and harassment, acts of racism and extremism, and death by suicide. All three of my children, two sons and a daughter, plus my son-in-law, are currently serving in the Army. Providing a safe and secure environment for our soldiers is not only my responsibility as Chief of Staff of the Army, it's also a deeply held personal commitment. We win through our people. The best fighting forces in the world ensure that their soldiers and units are masters of their craft. That is why we're shifting to a foundational readiness model that prioritizes training at the company level and below first. The Army has re rebuilt a high level of readiness with the support of Congress, but that readiness level is fragile. We must sustain that high level of readiness while continuing our most comprehensive transformation and modernization efforts in over 40 years. That is the only way we'll maintain our overmatch against our near peer competitors and would be adversaries. This year, we are turning our multi-domain operations concepts into real doctrine. We're not only developing, but delivering on our six modernization priorities, including our 31 plus four signature systems. With new doctrine, organizations, and equipment, the Army is offering multiple options to combatant commanders and multiple dilemmas to competitors and adversaries. And we're doing, doing so alongside our sister services and alongside our allies and partners. The U.S. Army never fights alone. We're the strongest land force in the world, and a great source of that strength comes from our allies and partners. As a people-based organization, we are uniquely qualified to foster these relationships. Thank you for your continued support to America's sons and daughters in uniform. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, appreciate the comments uh, of you and, and the Secretary. Uh, first off, I want to thank the Army. Uh, especially the soldiers of the National Guard for their efforts in supporting capital security mission over the last uh, several months. Uh, while there has been discussion on a much needed supplemental appropriations bill to cover these costs, I'm getting nervous about what will happen if those funds are not approved uh, and approved uh, soon. So Secretary Warmoth, can you give us some insight on how much the Army is insured across its components from that mission? What sort of trade-offs that you're going to have to make as you push funds around to cover those costs in the short term? Yes, Chairman Tester. Uh, right now, the, the uh, resources basically to pay for the support that the National Guard has provided to the Capitol, and I want to take a minute also to just uh, recognize their enormous contribution, is about $450 million. Uh, so that is, the, that is the bill associated with the, with the support that they provided uh, in this execution year. If we are not able to cover that, right now the Army Guard is basically in a situation where they are concerned about their ability to pay for training for the rest of this year. So without that, uh, those resources, the, the Guard, for example, you know, and this is in states all around the country, will find themselves with uh, training issues that are going to affect you know, both their aviation readiness, for example, uh, their ability to have uh, readiness with their ground vehicles. Uh, they're going to have, you know, again, many of the training exercises that they have put off because of everything else they've been doing in support of COVID, in support of the Southwest border, in support of being here in the Capitol. All of that regularly scheduled training has been postponed and now is at risk of not being able to be funded. And so uh, it's definitely a concern and something that will impact our guard all around the nation. Uh, so has training been postponed already? Uh, Senator, no. My, my sense of the situation is at this point, 
they have been, uh, they're in a position where they don't want to with spend funds for the remainder of the year because then they will be basically at a point of being in violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act. Gotcha. So it's really looking at the summer months, July, August, September. That's when it'll kick in. Yes. That's good to know. Uh, General McConville, uh, one th proposal that's being floated openly is the idea of a standing military quick reaction force for capital security. Uh, how do you feel about this mission, and do you think it's appropriate for the Army? Well, my, my best military advice, Senator, is law enforcement should be conducted by law enforcement agencies, and the military should be the last resort uh, when it comes to law, law enforcement. I appreciate your direct answer to that. Thank you very, very much. Um, shift the Pacific. Uh, we're we're uh, driving a lot of modernization priorities. Uh, to fight China, the Army's going to need helicopters with increased range and speed and uh, missiles with very long ranges. This year's budget request includes an increase in investments in Army's modernization priorities from $9.5 billion to $11.3 billion. General McConnell, can you give a quick overview of your increased investments in FY 2022 and and how uh, they support the shift to the Pacific? Uh, yes, yes, Senator. We have about $1.9 billion uh, focused on the Pacific. That does not include uh, the pay uh, for the 69,000 soldiers uh, that, that operate in the Pacific. Uh, key to um, uh, what we're providing the combatant commanders out there is we provide them new organizations, secure, Security Force Assistance Brigades, which allows them to work closely with our allies and partners in the region and build up their capacity. We're developing a multi-domain task force uh, that provides really two capabilities, long-range uh, precision effects, which is very, very important in the competition because they, they can do intelligence, they can do information operations, they can do cyber electronic warfare and space operations. They also have the capability which we're developing is long-range precision fires, which helps with deterrence because it gives us the ability to uh, potentially uh, penetrate any type of anti-access air denial capability that is set up by potential uh, competitors uh, in, in the region. We're also doing multiple exercises, so we, we have a chance to work with our uh, allies and partners, and we are present throughout the region, which is very, very important to reassuring um, uh, our fellow land components that will be there when, we, when they need us. Thank you, General. Senator Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Army's uh, fiscal year 2022 budget request for research and development continues to focus on six modernization priorities, yet the 22 budget proposal for research and development funding is $1.3 billion less than last year. Madam Secretary, now that you've taken the helm and begun to review these modernization efforts, are you considering any changes to the focus areas or the approach that the Army has taken to its modernization priorities? Vice Chairman, uh, generally I'm, I'm very comfortable with the modernization mm. priorities uh, that the Army has at this time. And as, as uh, General McConville was just speaking to, I think the kinds of capabilities we're looking at in terms of long-range precision fires, future vertical lift, um, you know, uh, next generation vehicles, and air and missile defenses also are all very appropriate to the kinds of near-peer challenges that we're facing. Uh, so broadly speaking, I am, I am comfortable with where we're heading. Uh, I think, you know, we are, we are going to have to continue carefully um, balancing between our modernization emphasis while also maintaining our readiness and taking care of our people. But I think we're going in the right direction on modernization, sir. Would you deem research and development uh, a very high priority period? Yes, it's uh, very important that uh, we continue to emphasize research and development. Yes, exactly. And we've got about 74% of our R&D account uh, focused on our 31 plus 4 priorities for modernization. General McConville, could you provide a general overview, uh, knowing we're not in a closed session, on the progress of the Army's six modernization priorities and outline what risk that the Army is accepting by reducing its research and development funding as it pursues those priorities. Well, well, Senator, it's a dangerous road, as you, you know. Yeah. Well, as as the um, the, the secretary said, is uh, we've done some tremendous work. We call it night court uh, to take a look at our 
modernization priorities and make sure that we align the resources with them and in the research and development. So we have moved uh, a tremendous amount of money, uh, about 74% of our research and mm -hmm. development funds focused on those modernization priorities. They are moving along very, very well. As you, as you know, Senator Hypersonics uh, is, is moving uh, extremely uh, quickly. We expect our, our first battery and uh, in, in 2023. Our mid-range capabilities moving along very capability. We expect to be able to sink ships in 2023. Our prison strike missile capabilities moving along very capability. We expect to have the first battery around 2023. Our next generation combat vehicle is, is moving out. That's going to come in about 2028. Uh, in, in future vertical lift, uh, we have two uh, different aircraft that we're developing. Both are flying models right now. Again, this is exceptionally fast, uh, delivering that to uh, the troops. So we want to fly before we buy, and, and that's coming in around 2028. We're making great strides in air and missile defense uh, so we can counter unmanned aerial systems. We're making great strides in convergence with our network and bringing together our sensors and shooters so we, we have the overmatch we need. And, and finally, for our soldiers, uh, we're getting them the lethality they need through an integrated visual augmentation system, a new carbine that's going to be much more lethal on the battlefield, and a new squad automatic weapon system. So we're very, very pleased with the progress uh, that we're making on the six modernization uh, priorities and, and, and really very pleased the way we're working with industry in a different way. Sir, the Army's Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office is leading the uh, development of long-range hypersonic weapons. This program is scheduled to conduct several test events in 2022. Uh, what do you expect to learn that you can talk about in this session today through the test events scheduled next year and how will the, this data from test events lead to decisions for the program uh, and how is development going on the thermal protection system, which I think is very important uh, there. Well, well Senator, um, as, as you know, we had a very successful uh, test uh, last year. We're getting ready to do mm -hmm. a, uh, another test over uh, the upcoming months. Um, that test is, is, is again, is going to confirm a lot of the systems. It's going to uh, make sure that the, the range that, that, you know, we're going to get a much better idea of what type of range uh, that the system can work. We know the precision is there. So what we're going to take away from uh, the testing is more uh, assurity when it comes to what's the range, the, you know, the, the max range of the system, what's the uh, precision of the system. And so far, we're very pleased with the progress. General, how is the development going on in the sensor integration display for the heads-up display component of the system? Well, the, the, the heads-up display for the, uh, I want to make sure. Yeah, the, the integrated visual augmentation. Oh, the, well, the in integrated visual augmentation system is transformational. Uh, it's coming along uh, very, very well. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the most transformational systems um, in, that we have in that we're able to fuse uh, night vision capability with an infrared capability, but more importantly, it provides situational awareness to our soldiers that we've never had before. And the future will be that soldiers will be able to fight with this system, they'll be able to uh, rehearse with this system, and they'll actually be able to train with this system in virtual reality. Madam Secretary, quickly, uh, uh, in the area of production, uh, some of us are concerned uh, that some of the proposed delays in uh, uh, building things uh, with our industrial base, you know, is, could be a problem. What's the Army doing to ensure that the industrial base will c remain viable for these programs if you slow walk some of them? Well, Senator, very quickly, I would say I think the primary thing we're doing is having Army Materiel Command undertake a 15-year plan mm -hmm. to essentially try to align uh, our future requirements and make sure that our organic industrial base mm -hmm. and the commercial industrial base can meet those needs over time. That's, that's the primary. But keeping idea. that industrial base together is very critical, is it not? Absolutely. We, we have to be able to have that industrial base to, to make all of the new next generation mm -hmm. systems that, that the chief was mentioning. Uh, and as you know, ensuring, frankly, the cybersecurity of our suppliers and our industrial base is also a key issue that we have to get after. All part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shelby. Senator Leahy. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you for having the hearing, and thank you 
both for appearing. General McConville, I, um, you may find it unusual that an appropriations uh, committee meeting, it may be a question that sounds parochial, but I think this has a, uh, a broader thing. The Vermont National Guards Mountain um, Cavalry Battalion opened every position to women. It can uh, recruit women directly to any position. I believe it's the first Army National Guard Cavalry unit at that level in the nation to do so. Now, I visited Bravo Troop uh, following, from that battalion. They were here at the U.S. Capitol following the January 6th insurrection and went from there to now they're deployed overseas. It's a remarkable uh, feat, I think, anyway. I'm very impressed by it. And the challenging nature of that feat reminds me of why many of us supported so long the removal of, of barriers to women serving, as well as all sorts of soldiers of different walks of life. I've always felt the Army is strongest when it finds the best soldier for the job, not the soldier for the job who meets certain preconceived notions. So how does the department's budget request support the recruitment and retention of soldiers from diverse backgrounds to a unit like Vermont's Mountain Cavalry? Yes, sir, I think um, the point is, is well taken, is you know we're in a competition. In fact, we're in a war for talent. Uh, in the United States. We want the best and brightest to come into the military. We want the military to represent the diversity uh, of the nation. Uh, and we're, we're doing that by having the right leadership uh, with the right background. So if, you're, if you want to take a look and see who's commanding recruiting command is, is a person of, of diversity so people can look up and see people like them. Our recruiters uh, come with uh, diversity so someone uh, can talk to them if they want to be in the infantry, if they want to be in the armor. And, and, and from where we sit is we want everyone to have an opportunity. And we are um, appealing to them, and, and we are giving opportunities uh, at every level so people can look up and see people who look like them, and that's how we keep the diversity in the Army. I, I appreciate that, and I, I look at a place like New England where um, – is getting harder and harder, and not taking just Vermont, but throughout the whole region, uh, harder and harder to uh, recruit. So I would urge you to empower local recruiters and adjuncts general as much as you can. And, and Madam Secretary, um, the U.S. military has long been at the forefront of energy revolutions. We, we all know make energy cheaper and less supply line Intensive makes a military force more capable. I've seen the way we remarkably change around sometimes in, in battle areas uh, around the world. The president has been investing in clean energy and energy efficient technology, a priority for every part of the U.S. government. This committee has even supported research with the Army Corps on energy efficiency technology over the years because it would free up money for other things. How does this request, your request, support development of clean energy and energy efficient technology? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Senator. Uh, within our, our budget, we are trying to do a few different things to try to help us advance uh, clean energy. And particularly in terms of our vehicle fleets, you know, we are exploring where we, where we can look at hybrid vehicles, potentially, how we can increase electrification uh, in our vehicle fleet. We are looking at um, trying to use battery-powered where we can. Uh, so there are a variety of efforts that we're trying to look at across all of our different types of vehicles to work with clean energy. We're also, uh, you know, again, looking at other ways that our installations can be more energy efficient. Uh, we, we are doing quite a bit to look at uh, where we can use solar power, for example, or wind power at our installations. I was just at Fort Hood and saw the solar panel fields there, for example. So we have a number of different places where we're trying to advance and, and go more towards clean energy. And that solar panel field you wouldn't have seen a few years ago. That's, that's probably true. I, I actually grew up in Texas, and I don't recall seeing solar panels there. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I... I have a question which I'll submit for the record for 
for the general, it's about, uh, gets a little bit uh, involved on construction issues, but general, I, when that comes in, don't, don't just let somebody push it out to the side. I really do want an answer. And I, 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 I know you'll supply one. Yes, Senator, I sure will. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Leahy. Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, uh, General McConville, welcome. Uh, congratulations on your new position, Secretary, and for your long distinguished service, uh, General McConville. Um, I'm going to visit uh, Germany and Poland in the near future, and uh, I will see transnational ex training exercises uh, focus on Russian deterrence. Um, we face lots of challenges around the globe. Uh, our focus is sometimes uh, shifted uh, by the necessity and by changing circumstances. What should be my takeaway? What do you hope I see and come back confirmed uh, of the importance of what we're doing? I want to make sure my mic is on. Uh, well, Senator, I, I think what I would hope that you would see is, is a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I hope you'll see the close partnerships we have with our uh, land forces in Europe. And obviously, you know, NATO is our center of gravity there. Uh, you know, our enhanced forward battalions with NATO are very important. And from an Army perspective, you know, I hope you'll see the, the value added that the forward element of the Fifth Corps uh, that we've now put in Poland what that is doing to, again, uh, bring our partners together and uh, present a strong deterrent to the Russians. That's what I would ask that you look for. Chief may have additional. No, I agree with the Secretary. I, I hope you see peace through strength. And, and that, that strength comes from a strong military, a strong army, and strong allies and partners. And I was just over there last week. Uh, we host a conference for European armies. Had 32 chiefs of staffs from, from all the countries coming together. Uh, they want American leadership. They want to be good allies and partners with us. They want to have a strong uh, friendship. And I think the way we deter others who wish us harm is by having all that come together. And, and the training is important, uh, just like any professional team. You've got to train. You've got to rehearse. You've got to peer. And that's where that strength comes from. Uh, thank you both. Uh, General McConville, um, given the rapid modernization of Russia and China's armor forces, uh, I have some concern that the Army's budget drops significantly below what's necessary to modernize a full brigade of Abrams tanks uh, each year. If Congress provides additional funding for Abrams production, uh, can you assure us that you will keep the Abrams production at least at the level of one brigade a year? What, what I, can, I can assure, Senator, is that is on my unfunded uh, requirement list, and if we do receive additional money, we will pr prioritize that and, 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 and go after those unfunded requirements. What, what's our capabilities of uh, ascertaining or making certain that the active and guard units that are scheduled to upgrade uh, those tanks receive them on time? Well, that's why we want, you know, that's why it's part of my unfunded requirement is to make sure, you know, we've had to make some tough decisions uh, in the Army based on priorities. And we are, when I look at the Abrams tank, that's not legacy to me. I see that as an enduring requirement. We also have modernization requirements, which are the six modernization priorities. Uh, but the Abrams tank is going to be here for a while. And we've incrementally improved it, and we need it for the future. But we also need to modernize the Army. And we're going to have to make the, you know, tough decisions based on the resources we get, and we will do that on the priorities. Uh, Secretary, uh, digital design and engineering has become an important resource uh, for weapon system development and sustainment. Uh, it's already proven its ability to increase sustainment efforts on legacy platforms, and I think will play a major role in the design of future defense programs. Uh, can you discuss the importance of making these dig digital designs more accessible to service members to give them the tools to increase readiness on legacy combat vehicles, and how does the department plan to invest in this new technology as we develop this next generation of war fighting uh, platforms? Senator, what I would say is uh, certainly uh, incorporating digital designs into our uh, prototyping and modernization process is very, very important. And frankly, we're trying to bring in as many different types of new techniques to help us be more innovative as possible. Uh, so, for example, I think that we're, we're uh, using digital design as we look at the new uh, optionally manned fighting vehicle, for example. Uh, and, 
there are undoubtedly other programs within our 31 plus 4 where, where we are making use of that. Uh, I have not been able to dive in, in in depth into how we're using digital design, but again, I know we are trying to be um, much more innovative. We are collaborating with, uh, with various universities, for example, with uh, companies, you know, smaller startup companies in Austin, for example, where we have Austin or where we have Futures Command. So we are, we are very much trying to bring things like digital design into our process. I hope to have you as a guest in Kansas where we can demonstrate that technology. I would welcome that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Senator Moran. I'll get you as you entered the room. Senator Shaheen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Secretary Wormuth and um, General McConville for your service. One of the new potential areas of conflict and certainly of a lot of other activities is the Arctic. And so it's very important that we know as much as possible and have as much research as possible about the Arctic. Um, one, of the, one of the labs in this country that does that research is in Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, it's the Cold Region Research and Engineering Lab. So can you just speak to whether, I guess this is for you, Secretary Wormuth, whether you think the Army Corps of Engineers labs are uniquely situated to confront the challenges that the Army and the Joint Force are going to be facing in the Arctic? Senator, I think, uh, yes, the Corps of Engineer labs are, are very helpful to us as we explore these new environments and what kind of requirements they're going to present to us. Um, the, the Arctic is absolutely becoming an arena of competition uh, between the Russians and the Chinese, for example. Uh, you know, Russia in particular has been enhancing its military posture in the region. China is definitely engaging in exploration more oriented towards natural resources. And as we think, as you know, the Army has put forward an Arctic strategy. And as we think about building that out and what kind of uh, formations and gear that we're going to need, I think we will want to leverage the Corps of Engineer Labs and, again, other, you know, uh, partnerships with the universities to help us think that through. Um, but yet the budget request cuts the Army's research and development. So can you speak to how we're going to continue the research that we need to do if we're making those cuts? Senator, uh, I think, you know, again, I would want to look carefully at what exactly the lab's have to offer and the resources associated with that. Uh, I was not yet in the secretary position, as you know, when our budget was made, uh, but we have had to make very difficult choices. Again, as we balance readiness, people, and modernization, we've had to make some difficult choices, but I'd certainly look into that and be happy to talk with you. Thank you. General McConville, do you have anything to add to that? But what I do have is, uh, as the Secretary said, on, on, you know, we've put out a new strategy for regaining dominance in the Arctic. It's a place that, you know, we really haven't taken a hard look at. You know, we've got a great state of Alaska. We have uh, troops up there. But we see us operating more in the Arctic than we have in the past. So we're going to have to have that capability. We're developing equipment. We're developing organizations that can do that. We're going to recruit the right people that can operate in that environment, make sure they have the right clothing and the right capabilities. But we see that as a place in the future that we need to be. And, and as I said, I met with the, our European allies, and the Arctic states are very interested in working with us on those capabilities. Thank you. Um, the enhanced night vision goggle, the binocular ENVG, um, is currently being fielded, and it's received really positive reviews. I, I know about this because we make it in New Hampshire. Um, but. I understand the FY22 request is approximately $218 million, um, which is um, less than what we had been projecting. So can you tell me, does the Army still plan to um, make those investments for the NVGB in 2023? Well, well Senator, as, as you know, those... The, the troops really like those goggles. They're extremely good. And, you know, we're developing two systems, the enhanced night vision goggle, um, Bravo, which that is called, which is you know, our, our troops. It's a great investments. We're also developing the, the IVAS system, which is a more sophisticated system. But that 
enhanced night vision goggle Bravo says is still going to be around. It's very, very good. It fuses uh, both night vision and flare to capability. There's some incredible videos out there of the troops talking about it. So we are committed to moving forward with that. Again, there, there's just tough decisions that are being made on the budget, and, um, and they are reflected in our budget. Um, I have a question which I will submit for the record on IVAS, but on Afghanistan, just briefly because I have only a little bit of time left, um, will there be a change in our budget requirements for Afghanistan because we're going to be leaving earlier than anticipated? I understand we expect all troops to be out by the end of July. Senator, uh, our budget reflects, you know, the, the expected savings from the retrograde out of Afghanistan. I think as the uh, department determines exactly what the posture is going to look at in support of the over-the-horizon requirements, uh, you know, we, we may have to look at what the resources are going to be attached to that. And can you tell me what the savings are? are uh, I don't have that. don't immediately put those dollars into the over the horizon. I, I don't have that number off the top of my head, Senator, but I'm happy to take the question for the record and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Sheehan. Senator Blunt. Th thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Secretary Wormuth, uh, congratulations on uh, your nomination and confirmation as Secretary. Look forward to the work you'll be doing there. Our biggest base uh, in Missouri is uh, Fort Leonard Wood. It's uh, in many ways the schoolhouse for a lot of the military right now, principally Army still, but I think on any given day there are probably more people from different services there than any base in the country. I, I hope you can get that on your list to visit and you'll find a community incredibly supportive of the fort and what happens there. And uh, General McConville, uh, thank you again for your service and for being here today. With the um, future budget necessities, I, I don't know if that includes, a, is likely to include a basic combat training reduction or not. I, I'd like both of your thoughts on that. And if there is a basic combat reduction there, while we're talking about Fort Leonard Wood, the original goal at Fort Leonard Wood was basic training. We've gone way beyond that, but still an important part of what happens there. Uh, there are three other basic training facilities. If there's a reduction, I think people representing those four facilities, certainly me, would advocate that that reduction be proportional rather than eliminating training in one base. So one, do you think there will be a reduction? And two, do you have thoughts on what would happen in those four bases in training if there is a reduction? General? Uh, Senator, uh to my knowledge at this time, we are not contemplating a reduction in basic training at this time. Um, but I think, you know, certainly if we had to do that, it would be concerning. But I think we would want to look at um, what makes most sense in terms of uh, efficiency and effectiveness in terms of managing our resources. So uh, I would want to look at the four places where we, where we do basic training and basically run the numbers to see uh, where, if we had to reduce basic training, how we could do that most efficiently. It might be that doing that proportionately would be most efficient, but it might be that it made more sense to perhaps consolidate our training in, in you know, some less than all four locations. So I think I'd want to look at that. General, do you have a view of that? Uh, yes, Senator. My, my view is, is, as I discussed, is you know we've we've got a uh, end strength of 485,000, a little over a million. We think that's required. We think the training to to uh, support that is required, and and so we do not anticipate unless we have some type of resource reduction uh, to cut basic training. I think we need the army we have, given this the situation that we see around the world. Well, if you, if you do cut a location, we could discuss that at that time, but, but clearly if you get into an up-tempo again, having to start another location from what it would have become a dramatic reduction uh, would make a difference. And while we're on Fort Leonard Wood, we have made substantial commitments there uh, in the last four budgets toward the Fort Leonard Wood Community Army Hospital. It was the number, it was number one on the Surgeon General, on the... Uh, Army uh, Surgeon General's list uh, and the overall Force Surgeon General's list for a long time, and uh, we're well into that process. I think the 
money's being requested for FY22 to finish that uh, hospital really matters to the base and really matters um, to the community. On um, the um, general, as we withdraw from Afghanistan, um, what impact is that going to have on our rotation of forces, which have been Afghanistan, Korea, uh, Europe, and elsewhere? Still thinking rotating the forces I think is what the we're, best we're, way to, to handle that? Well, I think, I think Senator, uh, you know, what, what is being done is really a global posture review. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, what type of forces uh, we need. There's, there's some value in having rotational forces. There's value in having permanent forces. There's value in having... Uh, what we call pre-positioned stocks, so the troops rotate in and fall on those equipments. And, and we're in the process of uh, the administration is, is having that discussion. And what we will do is lay out those options uh, based on what it looks like. And, and some, when you look at Afghanistan, there's discussions of what's over rising, you know, what, what does the future look like in the Middle East? So that has to be looked at. There's a, there, the administration is taking a look at what does the Indo-Pacific look like, and then certainly what Europe uh, looks like. All those will come into uh, discussion and we'll provide the appropriate uh, best military advice on how to accomplish that mission. But I do see some rotational forces. I don't see all rotational forces. All right. At least one of the questions I'll ask for the record would be as we uh, poll the uh, contingency overseas account into the regular budget, what impact that has on our flexibility when we have something we don't anticipate. And uh, I'm out of time, so I'll ask that uh, for the record and uh, look forward to your re response on that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blunt. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the upcoming JLTV recompete uh, provides an opportunity to seek upgrades and to improve the vehicle's capabilities. Um, I'm particularly interested in efforts to transition the JLTV to electric powertrains, uh, considering the advantages it would provide in future environments and because it would support the President's interests in promoting green energy. Um, I know we just had a little discussion about electrification within uh, uh, the Army. Um, why is the JLTV program not pursuing a more aggressive transition to electrification? And is this something that you are considering for the recompete, uh, Senator Baldwin, again, I have not had the opportunity to dive deeply into some of these programs. I know that the follow-on production for the JLTV is, is on track, and uh, we're looking at you know how to move forward that, with that particular contract. I would ask General McConville to try to speak to your question of how the Army has been thinking about it in terms of electrification efforts. Please. I think, Senators, um, it, 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 what we're seeing with, you know, we, we have efforts going for electrification. We've got a reconnaissance vehicle that we're actually trying to make fully elective. These tend to be smaller vehicles rather than larger vehicles. So, we, you know, and there's value in that. And first of all, it reduces uh, our ability to provide uh, fuel, which we like to do. That keeps, you know, um, trucks off the road and those type of things. But they're also very, very quiet, which is helpful when you're maneuvering on the battlefield. Some of the bigger vehicles in, in the joint uh, light tactical vehicle, first, that's a great vehicle, is, is, is very good for the troops, is we're looking at probably a hybrid, you know, how do you reduce fuel in a hybrid, you know, and, and, and we're looking at our bigger vehicles, too. Do you go to hybrid first? We're, we're, we're concerned, and we have people looking at electrification, but on the larger combat vehicles, what can you do in the near term? What can you do in the long term? And in some cases, we're not sure we can get to fully electrification, but can we get to a hybrid that cuts fuel by 25%? Can we reduce how they operate at idle, which, you know, saves fuel? And so uh, we have folks taking a look at that. But as far as going to a full electrification of that vehicle, I don't think we're, we're there yet. Okay. Um on modernization, uh, I know the Army is uh, divesting from legacy programs to fund other priorities. Uh, but the JLTV certainly is not a legacy uh, a program or platform. Uh, yet, over the last four years, the Army has um, often characterized the platform as a smaller MRAP or uh, designed for the last war. Um, the requirements that drove the creation of the JLTV do not support this claim, 
and the program was never designed to be the next MRAP for Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, to their credit, the Marines have looked to the JLTV in their shift to supporting uh, the Navy against peer adversaries, using the JLTV as the platform to support new shore-to-ship uh, and long-range uh, fire uh, uh, capabilities. Are you familiar with these uh, Marine Corps initiatives, and are you exploring any similar efforts uh, at this point in time? Yeah, I, I, I am um, aware of what the Marine Corps is doing. Uh, they've got some innovative ideas with the joint like tactical vehicle. Um, what we're looking at is how we bring it into the force, and our numbers are significantly larger than what the Marine Corps is doing with the joint like tactical vehicle. We have goals set up there, and, and, and really what happens, uh, that is an enduring vehicle. That's not a legacy vehicle. I just want to make sure people, you know, because we, we've kind of had to characterize, because there's legacy, there's enduring, and then there's the modernization efforts we have. So I see really three categories as we discuss. The joint like tactical vehicle is an enduring vehicle. It's something that we need in the future. It's, uh, it's, it, 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 but it all comes down to we're trying to give you all the best army we can give you with the resources we have. Okay. I, I just would point out that um, the JLTV continues to sort of act as a bill payer for other programs in the PB22, um, resulting in about $120 million um, unfunded requirement for the Army. So um, that's of concern. Uh, I, let me just uh, add, I think I have limited time left, um, that Senator Shelby uh, asked earlier about uh, the industrial base. And uh, I believe, Secretary, you said that there was a report in the works from Material Command. Um, I would uh, like to get briefed on that uh, report when uh, it is available. Um, and uh, so I uh, look forward to receiving that. Yes, Senator, it's in development now and we'd be happy to discuss it when it's complete. All right, thanks. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Senator Bozeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here, and we really do appreciate your service to our country in so many different ways. Uh, as ranking on MILCON um, of the Appropriations Subcommittee, I know the importance of investing in quality of life projects such as barracks and family housing, as well as the impact of increased morale among the soldiers and their families that that generates. Strength of the armies is people. And certainly I know that, that you all agree that that should be right at the top of the list regarding priorities. Madam Secretary, given a tough budget cycle this year, how do, you, how do we adequately address the funding for barracks, family housing, other quality of life issues uh, that are so important? Senator Bozeman, you're absolutely right that uh, housing for our soldiers and our families is very, very important. And... The Army has undertaken a number of initiatives in the last few years to try to make sure that we are providing the kinds of uh, housing for our families and soldiers that they need. You know, we have, we have uh, consolidated, for example, oversight of our privatized housing with Army Materiel Command and Installations Command. Uh, in terms of barracks in particular, we have a plan to invest about $11.5 billion over 10 years to refurbish those, you know, barracks that are not as in good condition as some of the others. Sure. Uh, and, for example, I was just at Fort Hood a week or two ago, and I saw some of our newer barracks, uh, which I thought were quite satisfactory, but some of the barracks, frankly, that need to be modernized. Um, and, and we are trying to do that uh, as quickly as we can in the context of a flattening budget. So there have been some difficult choices, uh, I think there are some, some barracks facilities, for example, on General McConville's unfunded requirements list, but we do have a plan to try to move forward as quickly as possible to make sure that our soldiers have the housing they deserve. Very good. <laughs> and we appreciate the list, General. You all are not bashful at all, and uh, hopefully we can be of help in, uh, in securing some additional funds along those lines. Uh, General, over the past four years, the Army has worked tirelessly to restore its readiness levels, uh, which is, again, is so important. Uh, it's fragile. 
if not adequately sustained, it can it can decline very quickly, as we've seen at, at different times in the past. You mentioned the Army is implementing a foundation readiness model that will prioritize training at the company level. Uh, I guess the question is, do we have enough training capacity and resources on the active duty installations, or do we need to perhaps augment those installations with regional maneuver training centers to meet the intent of your foundation, foundational readiness model? Well, Senator, I think, I think we have uh, the appropriate amount of training areas of, available. Uh, you know, what we're finding is that it's the time for soldiers to train. And, that, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to focus, you know, if you only have so much time and so much resources, where do you spend those resources? Mm -hmm. I argue that you do it, we have new troops. You have new troops coming into units. We bring in about 125,000 soldiers every single year. They have to get the basics. They have to get the training. They live in our, our organizations we call squads. And so you get the squad straight, you get the platoon straight, you get the company straight, and then we can take our battalions and brigades to our national training centers and our combat training centers and making sure they get the higher level type training. But if you don't get the foundation right, it's like building a house on a poor foundation. It may look good on the top, but it's not good in the bottom. So that's the shift we're doing right now with, with the time and resources we have available. So with Afghanistan coming down, will the op tempo decrease or will it be maintained? Or? Well, the amount of troops we have in Afghanistan is, is pretty small. I mean, we're talking, you know, with, at, 2,500 troops at, at the time, that's not a tremendous amount of troops right. when you take a look at where we were at. So a lot of people said, hey, is that going to change a whole lot of things? Not, not too much for the Army. The 2,500 you know, brigade plus, is, you know, brigade minus is not a huge amount of troops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, the uh, Army National Guard is uh, expected to deploy and fight alongside the uh, active duty counterparts. Army currently trains on the MQ-1C Gray Eagle out of Fort uh, Huachuca in Arizona. And I understand they're, they're having trouble getting enough training for the active duty members, just the volume. Uh, and so my understanding is it's also difficult to get guardsmen through that training. So are we training enough soldiers to operate the Gray Eagle in a timely fashion? My first question. I, I think so, Senator. I'm sure we could train more, but um, at least the, uh, the amount of uh, aircraft we have, it's, it's a trade-off, is that those who are going to use them. Uh, you know, the, the other thing with the Gray Eagle, as we look to the future, um, is that, and, and we see a contested air defense environment, we're going to have to take a look at what the utilization of that aircraft is. As we take a look at our... Uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance aircraft uh, that we have in the force. Uh, many were designed for what we call irregular warfare, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, where there's not a big air defense capability. So uh, as we look in the future, we're going to have to take a hard look at what type of aircraft we have doing that mission. Right, but the, uh, the Army National Guard doesn't have its own M uh, MQ-1C uh, aircraft or great uh, Gray Wolf Air, what do they call it? The Gray Eagle, excuse me. Gray Eagle. Aircraft. Gray they don't have yeah. it. That's right. So you, it seems to me you've got a bit of a bottleneck in terms of just getting your active duty forces through, let alone training guard. Then the guard's supposed to support that mission, which they do tremendously well, and many others. Uh, but they don't have uh, the Gray Eagle. So both in terms of training and then actually having units that have the Gray Eagle, how, how do we address that? Because you've got both the training issue but you also have an equipment issue when you want the, the guards supporting your active duty forces. They have to have that equipment to train on. Well, that's what we're taking a look at, Senator, and then we can take that for the record and come back to you. Because I, I think I, I saw, you know, as I look at where we're going in the future, we, we've got to come up with a, as the strategy has changed, we need to come up with the right. way we're going to do well, that. Well, you've got that equipment across all your battle groups, active duty, but but nothing in the guard. That's right. And you got a training. So it's something we do need to help you address. Yeah, we'll take a look at it. Thank you, General. Appreciate that. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, so obviously unmanned is a big issue, uh, and, uh, and then also countering unmanned aircraft, and then various forces deal with it, uh, you know, in different ways. Obviously, in, in the Army sphere, uh, you've got the small unmanned aircraft that you have to deal with uh, for your troops. Uh, you operate the Joint Counter Small Unmanned Aircraft System Office, uh, which 
works with DOD to counter uh, small unmanned um, UAS. We, we have one of the UAS sites, actually, matter of fact, the first one established in North Dakota, uh, the uh, uh, Upper Plains um, the uh, test site, or Great Plains test site, I should say. Um, how do we, and then we, we work a lot with uh, Customs and Border Protection, too, because we've got 900 miles of border responsibility on the counter UAS. So how are you working that issue, and how can we be helpful to you in continuing to develop this counter small UAS uh, as arms issue? Thank you, Senator. Uh, certainly we are, you know, the entire Department of Defense is concerned about the UAS uh, problem. You know, all you have to do is look at and see how drones were used in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, to see the potential threat that they pose, uh, both, you know, to our forces overseas, but potentially here at home. We're the executive agent uh, for the um, joint program office that's responsible for looking at counter small UAS capabilities. And uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, which we work with closely, is actually responsible for uh, liaising, if you will, with the interagency, for example, with Department of Homeland Security and the Customs and Border Patrol. But we are working very closely with them, as well as with the FAA, to look at uh, how best to counter those kinds of threats. Uh, and I think the, the center of excellence can be very helpful to us as we continue to work that hard problem. So who, who would we link in with at your office or Army, or who would be the right person for us to connect with to really talk about how we can do some partnering or provide some assistance in this effort? Well, you could certainly uh, talk to us in our joint program office, and I think in terms of uh, looking towards other partners in the federal family, uh, you would probably want to talk to the OSD Homeland Defense Office. Yeah, I mean, we have a ton of partners. I mean, Guard, Active Duty, the military forces, Customs and Border Protection, so, uh, the state. I mean, we've got a ton of NASA. So I'm just trying to understand the best point person to make sure we've clicked in with you in terms of what Army's needs are. Uh, yeah, I think our joint program office is the best belly button. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hovind. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary General, welcome. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, I haven't had an opportunity to to personally congratulate you, so we did it over the phone, but um, nice to have you here. I appreciated the conversation that we had last week regarding the Arctic, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I feel like I've arrived when the Senator from New Hampshire asks the first Arctic question for the hearing. It's like, hallelujah, uh, we are here. Um, we've been here for a long while, and, and the uh, military has recognized that. Certainly, the Army has recognized that. We've had an opportunity to talk about the Arctic Strategy a document that has been released. Um, I, this is probably for both of you um, with regards to, to where in the, in the strategy, we note that the current unit distribution and alignment for Arctic operations may require configuration. The Army will evaluate and adjust as necessary tactical and operational headquarters and unit relationships to best support. So uh, we, we're, where are we in this? What, uh, what, specifically, um, what specifically and when specifically can we, uh, can we see this evaluation moving forward? Where in the organization is this review uh, being considered? Kind of let me know where we are with, with this uh, alignment for Arctic operations. Senator Murkowski, it's, it's nice to see you as well. Um, and thank you for those congratulations. We are, uh, having now issued the Army Arctic strategy, we're really in the process of looking at exactly uh, its implications in terms of what kind of units we might want to see in the Arctic, exactly what kinds of equipment they would need uh, to, to carry out those roles. And, and I have to be briefed, frankly, in more detail myself in terms of where we are precisely in our thinking. So why don't I ask if General McConville can speak in a little bit more detail to your timelines. And, and Senators, as, as, as we lay out uh, in, in the strategy, you know, we, we have uh, an administrative headquarters uh, right now uh, in Alaska. We see that becoming an operational headquarters. How that actually um, kind of works out, it, you know, we've got other operational headquarters similar to maybe what's in Italy right now. It's, it's not a division, but it's an operational headquarters that has the ability to respond and command and control troops 
That is what uh, General IFA will set up, and that's in the process of being done. Uh, we're taking a look at how we equip really the striker brigade uh, with the appropriate equipment because the striker is a great you know, capability, but it's not really designed to operate um, 12 months a year up in Alaska. So we're taking a look at what that looks like and how we put that to capability. We're also taking a look at, uh, I, was, I was up at Natick, uh, which is developing some really high speed cold weather gear. And, and that's the type of you know, gear we would like to get uh, to that brigade so they can truly operate. They do a lot of great work up there, but how do we do that? And then even looking at what type of people do we recruit for that brigade? You know, people that live there, live in, you know, that we, we can reach out to uh, people that would be very, we really want to go and work in that environment. So there's states and certainly Alaska where we can write contracts. If you want, you can, you'll, we'll guarantee you're going to serve in this area and you can do those type things. Um, we're taking a look at a potentially a multi-domain task force. What that looks like, you know, so we have the capability uh, for um, anti-access area denial capability, working that with NORTHCOM. So all these things are kind of coming together, and as we do the posture review, as we look at the resources available, that'll all drive uh, this as we move out over the next couple of years. Well, it is really encouraging to hear you say this, um, because it is, it is really all-encompassing. It's looking at the assets, the equipment that we need to have, and I want a little bit of an update on where we are with this, with this um, bridging the gap between the SUSV and, and the CAT-V. Um, we recognize that you've got to have the equipment, but if you don't have the gloves and the gear and, and everything that you need in an Arctic environment, it's pretty tough even to operate the, the, the equipment that we're talking about. So things like clothing are actually pretty important. So again, it was, it was good to hear Senator Sheehan even acknowledge that. But I'm really intrigued um, uh, about the, the focus on what you're calling focused recruiting looking at, at men and women who perhaps come from a part of the country where it's, it's mountainous, it's cold, you've got, uh, you've got perhaps not Arctic conditions, but you're used to the cold. Um, I, I think we recognize that uh, part of the, the quality of life initiatives that we deal with in a place like Alaska, it's really hard with, with certain individuals um, and their families um, when you have never, ever, ever had an exposure to the cold, to the dark, to snow, and then we plant you there and say, go off and do your job. And it is challenging, and I think we see this in some of the issues that we have been facing. Um, we've had an opportunity to talk about this spike in soldier suicide. That's something that we've got to, to get our arms around. But I, I really appreciate that from a strategy perspective, it really is a, a, a much more broad and encompassing. Um, I've kind of dangled the question about the, the SUSV and the CATV. I'm over time, but if you have a quick update on that. I know we, we, right now we're in the process. Um, uh, again, I, I gotta be careful with they're, they're the aqua, we'll, we'll come back with a, 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 an answer on that. I know we're, they're going through the process right now and, and I'm kind of concerned if I talk about the process, I might not be doing what I should be doing. We'll come back with, a, with an answer on that. I, I know we're working that right now. I appreciate that, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murkowski. As the Arctic becomes uh, more and more real, which it's real right now, the, the points you bring up are certainly valid. Uh, and sign me up. That's all I got to say. I, I, don't think, I don't think I'd meet the quali qualifications you need in the Army right now, but what the hell. Uh, it, it, we're going to close this out right now, and I really appreciate uh, your testimony here today. Uh, senators uh, may uh, submit additional written questions, and of course we would ask you to answer those in a reasonable period of time. This de defense subcommittee will reconvene on Thursday, June 24th at 10 a.m. to hear from the Navy and the Marine Corps leadership on FY22 Department of Navy budget request. With that, this subcommittee stands in recess.